All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your continued um, suggestions. Uh, the next one here that we're watching today is uh, Templin's Imperial Guard lore video. So let's get, get into it here. Attention Institute personnel. This investigation marks the release of Templin 2.0. Templin 2.0. Anyone pledged to our Patreon page at $10 and above before November 30th will receive an exclusive and limited edition Operation Thundershark pack. Oh, that's pretty cool. Thundershark. Noise. Stick around after this episode for more details. The Emperor wills it, and you shall obey. You shall obey. Did they do anything cool on their, uh, on their pa Patreon? I'm broke, so I probably shouldn't do anything, but just curious. The Imperium is over. Across the universe, a death knell has sounded, for the time of ending has begun. Tyranid High Fleets move inexorably towards the guiding light of the Astronomicon. Orcs in the trillions gather around the banners of the warlord Jazwul Thraka. Necron tombs, silent for millennia. Now what are these guys? Hold on. To Necron, I'm sure I'm sure I'll get there and eventually watch that video explaining what they are, but they look pretty sick. And a warp storm of unprecedented fury has torn the galaxy in two. The final prelude, it is whispered, to the ultimate victory of the ruinous powers. The fate of humanity rests with the myriad of forces at the Imperium's command. A single shot fired by the Officio Assassinorum. Yo, I'm so excited to get into this shit. This guy, this guy right here, looks like Deathstroke or some some shit from uh, it's Deathstroke. Is it Marvel? I think so. End a rebellion before it begins. The Collegia Titanica can grind entire worlds to powder. The Adepta Sororitas can cast the Holy Word of the Emperor to even the darkest corners of the galaxy. But of all the armies to have ever raised their weapons and banners in the defense of mankind, there is one above all through which the destiny of the Imperium will be decided. Each day on a million worlds, women and men, ordinary citizens of the Imperium, depart their homes, often never to return. They are sent to the front lines of wars beyond number and against eldritch creatures. In Was this a draft situation? That's what it sounds like. to hold the line they are slaughtered in the ruins of once proud cities in the depths of forgotten battlefields and to the laughter of thirsting gods but for 10,000 years that line has held for 10,000 years one force in the galaxy has stood against the enemies of the Imperium and spoken to them in the language of fire each day on a million worlds women and men Language of fire, is she talking about an actual language or am I just being dumb and she's talking about like being fired at kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Ordinary citizens of the Imperium depart their homes so they might fight for humanity as soldiers in the Astra Militarum, the Imperial Guard. The scale and complexity of the Imperial Guard rivals that of the Imperium itself. It is the largest coordinated fighting force in the galaxy, serving as the first and often only line of defense against the innumerable powers that threaten the continued existence of mankind. While it is famous for the vast numbers of tanks, aircraft, and artillery under its command, at its core, it is comprised of countless billions of mortal soldiers. Okay, so yeah, I, I, it's leaning more towards a draft kind of deal. These are just like normal ish human grunt soldiers it seems pretty relatable i guess you know organized into hundreds of thousands of regiments the recruitment of these regiments is among the most pivotal duties assigned to every imperial commander planetary lord or imperial governor according to the law of the imperium every world under its authority must maintain a standing army to preserve the planetary government and deter any form of internal insurrection or foreign invasion. Each of these planetary defense forces exist as their own individual bodies, 
free to defend their own worlds and enforce their own standards as they see fit, provided they contribute a fraction of their number to serve the wider Imperium and join the Imperial Guard. The method by which these troops are recruited varies significantly from sector to sector and planet to planet. Defense forces of many worlds are little more than rival gangs, nomadic tribesmen, or condemned criminals. Welcome in, Hoot. You're catching me in the middle of a YouTube video here, if you'll just bear with me. Uh, yeah, welcome in. Uh, we're watching uh, Imperial Guard. Uh, it's a 40k lore video. People keep suggesting me to watch them on, uh, on YouTube, so that's what we're, what we're doing. Other planets might have well-established professional standing armies who view recruitment into the Imperial Guard as a noble, heroic pursuit. Thank you, Hoot. However, the Appreciate you. However, the and units selected to join the Imperial Guard are chosen, their quality reflects on that world's ruler. Should a regiment provided to the Imperial Guard be of insufficient quality, the life of even a planetary governor is immediately forfeit. For this reason, the soldiers selected for the Astra Militarum tend to be drawn from the elite troops of any planetary defense force. Wait, so it's... Is it a draft or is it not a draft? I guess not, because it says that they're, like, most elite forces. So it's, like, special forces? Even so, the composition and number of regiments drawn from each planet is wildly diverse. A highly industrialized hive world with a trillion imperial citizens might be required to provide hundreds of millions of soldiers, tens of millions of tanks, and other mechanized equipment. These would be supplemented by professional uniforms, munitions, replacement parts, and every manner of material required to outfit and sustain a force of that size. An agricultural or feudal world, by contrast, might have a significantly lower military tribute providing as little as a million men and a hundred thousand cavalry. Such soldiers may lack even the most rudimentary equipment. Hold on, what's this dude riding? Is that a horse? It doesn't look like one. And possess little experience handling anything more complex than a windmill. This enormous disparity within the Imperial Guard makes any attempt at standardization impossible. Every regiment is equipped in the manner of their homeworld. Hold on, what the fuck is this guy? It's like some kind of cursed... Lynx looking thing. Dumb horse. <laughs> and many such yes. Worlds have grown famous for the conduct of their soldiers. Prized by even the Adeptus Terra as the epitome of the Astra Militarum are the Cadian Shock Troops. The regiments of Cadia are equipped with the highest standards of gear available, and the martial culture of their homeworld has imbued every soldier with a natural affinity for life in military service. So I know Star Wars has shock troopers. I've never really looked into it. Uh, does anyone know what the shock part means? Is it just like a shock and all force kind of thing? Like they just like drop in and just surprise people? Is that their deal? Cadia itself is but a memory destroyed during the 13th Black Crusade of Abaddon the Despoiler. But that memory has served the Imperium as much in death as in life. Factory worlds across the galaxy produce equipment for the Imperial Guard to Cadian specifications, and countless regiments are trained and deployed in the fashion of their Cadian brethren. Equally Okay, who it <clears throat> so shock troops is kinda like ODST. What does ODST stand for, by the way? Not really sure. If less ubiquitous regiments are raised on worlds spanning the breadth of the Imperium. The ice warriors of Valhalla are said to be as inexorable as the winter itself, ruthless as the bitter frost, and as certain as death. They have acquired an infamous reputation for their thundering artillery barrages, combined with waves of charging infantry. Valhallans are the masters of Arctic warfare, viewed by outsiders as somehow impervious to harsh conditions or the value of human life. Fueled by the forges... Okay, o ODST is Orbital Drop Shock Trooper. So yeah, it's kind of like a... What is it? What's the name of it? Paratrooper. Is like a paratrooper unit? Is that... Am I thinking the right thing there? ...of their hive world and millennia of warfare are the regiments of the Armageddon Steel Legion. Highly mechanized and mobile, the Steel Legion has an unequaled number of tanks and armored personnel carriers... Thank you, Hoot. Thank you for filling me in. Supported in the skies above by gunships and fighter aircraft. 
the Mordian Iron Guard are widely derided for their stiff and unforgiving demeanor, ridiculed as more troubled with maintaining their brightly colored uniforms and marching in perfect formation than the more pragmatic concerns of soldiery. Yeah, that's silly. Why would you wear your dress uniform, basically? They're... I guess it's not a dress uniform for, like, olden days. I... Like, the red coats and whatnot, they had a similar dress, but, like, that's not... Definitely not for space battle. That does not sound ideal, ideal because it's like probably guerrilla warfare ish, you know. Such discipline is an absolute necessity on their strictly rationed home worlds, however, and in battle, their iron resolve makes them cold blooded killers. They will hold their ground at any cost, laying waste to the enemy with perfectly disciplined fire. The desert raiders of Cal Before, I, I know I'll probably get shit for this, but. My least favorite part of the military was was marching. I know it's like to build discipline or whatever, but I fucking hated it. It's so dumb. Like when when are you ever going to use that? Like when are you ever going to have to neatly walk? <laughs> like it it, did, it doesn't help the force at all, I don't think. I mean, if you're not disciplined enough to do that, then you're not, you shouldn't be there anyways, but that's just my opinion. Um Metal tin hens against leather armor would would win. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't doesn't seem like a good armor situation. Talon, by contrast, are unequaled within the guard for their guerrilla tactics. Evasive and opportunistic, they have perfected the doctrine of hit and run warfare, harassing their opponents without mercy before disappearing into the dust kicked up by their rugged mounts. Yeah, exactly. These guys are super guerrilla warfighters and. They would decimate that other group in the like dress uniforms, walking in formation and shit. Every regiment in the Astra Militarum, regardless of their home world, possess some level Big of robot. Freedom. But none can match the notoriously grim warriors of the Death Corps of Creed. Once a prosperous hive world, Creek today is an atomic wasteland, the result of a rebellion against the Imperium for which its soldiers must now atone. They are synonymous with their heavy great coats and sinister gas masks. Rarely yeah, the horse gas masks are pretty cool. I mean, everyone has them, but I've never seen a horse gas mask before. ...removing them even to eat or drink. They specialize in wars of attrition, where their willingness to die for the Emperor exceeds any other consideration. What? They don't take them off to eat or drink. They see, that's even more hardcore than the Mandalorians, right? Because they still take their their stuff off to eat if they can, if they're alone. I don't think that there's... How does that work? Do they just eat, like, milkshakes? Is that what they do? <laughs> but in the minds of many across the Imperium... It's just Rambo. That's, that's just Rambo. But, are they the Rambonians? I hope so. ...alone is a worthy successor to Cadia. It is a death world of unrelenting butchery where every plant, animal, and insect are hostile to human life. Katachans have a well-deserved reputation as the deadliest jungle warfare experts in the galaxy. Katachans? Is that what the name is? <laughs> they starve. <laughs> yeah, those dudes in the gas mess, they just starve. They don't eat. As even the bloodiest battle might be a favorable reprieve compared to life on their home world. Close combat is their particular specialty, along with extensive use of traps, mines, and improvised weaponry. With no other resources, knowledge, or worth, regiments of jungle fighters are the sole export of Katachan and used to devastating effect. There are countless other regiments of renown within the Astra Militarum. The Vestroyan Firstborn, the Attilan Rough Riders, the Elysian Drop Troops, or the Panic First and Only. But for every world or regiment honored for the heroism and dedication of its soldiers, a thousand more remain unsung and I saved just before this hoot. Emperor himself. I promise. Regardless of their origin, every regiment is subordinate to the Lord Commander Militant. In theory, this individual passes on the dictates of the High Lords of Terra to the Lord Commander <laughs> of each segmentum, who in turn hold authority and responsibility for vast swaths of the galaxy. I did almost forget, so thank you. Militant is primarily a political position, more concerned with overseeing the bureaucracy of the Departamento Munitorum 
and devoted to the general administration, personnel assignment, supply, and military logistics of the Imperial Guard. You don't have to yell. It's fine. In the rare instances in which centralized command has been imposed over far-flung Imperial regiments, the results are often disastrous. The unpredictable realities of faster-than-light travels mean that communiques and orders arrive years or decades after they were meant to, or in a single garbled transmission impossible to understand. Entire wars have been lost when dogmatic commanders have stubbornly implemented nonsensical orders to their subordinates. The practicalities of the galaxy and of command instead dictate that authority over the Imperial Guard falls to the officer of the highest rank in any given theater of war. What is this guy doing? Anyone knows? He's like connected to this orb. Is that like in, coming from his, his brain? Is that what we're seeing there? Looks weird. While such a command structure is plagued by overlapping regions of authority, competing commanders issuing conflicting orders, and needless complexity, it is the only method by which the Astra Militarum can remain flexible enough to remain operationally effective. Individual commanders vary tremendously in their approach. Some command from miles behind the front line, or from the relative safety of low orbit. Others are present where fighting is thickest, leading their soldiers through example. In other A, you gotta have the biggest balls to actually, like, be there with the men that you're commanding. I, I respect that so much, but it is not ideal. Let's be honest. <laughs> forces are subordinate to other branches of the Imperial military. It is not uncommon for Imperial Guard regiments to supplement the Space Marines of the Adeptus Astartes, the Skitari of the Adeptus Mechanicus, or any other force as required. In rare cases, such as during an Imperial Crusade or an extraordinary threat to the entire Imperium, a commander within the Astra Militarum might be granted the title of War Master. This individual is second only to the Lord Commander Militus and the supreme authority over every Imperial military force within their area of operations. There is rarely more than one War Master within the Imperium at any one time, and many who are granted it prefer to instead be known as a High Solar, rather than be associated with the very first Imperial War Master, the Traitor Horus. The organizational structures of the Astra Militarum are defined by the ancient text known as the Tactica Imperium. What's this homie doing? It's like a shrunken head. <laughs> I'd hate the I hate the little legs on it, but crawling around and shit. Wait, miss me with that. Miss me. Its knowledge stretches back into antiquity, and many of its teachings predate the rule of the Emperor, the Dark Age of Technology, and the unification of ancient Terra. At its most basic tenets, the Tactica Imperium groups squads together based on their specialization. Infantry platoons comprise infantry companies, which in turn make up infantry regiments. Tanks, cavalry, artillery, and support regiments are structured in this same manner. Regiments together, therefore, complement each other's strengths and weaknesses, ensuring that the army as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Oh, this just popped into my head. These, these aircraft remind me of aircraft that I worked on in the Air Force. Uh, the CV-22 Osprey, if you guys know anything about that. It's in, like, all the futuristic uh, Call of Duty games. It's the one that can take off, like, a helicopter, and then it turns, and then it's basically an airplane. Uh, they actually, they're uh, decommissioning all of them. I just heard I just heard about this earlier today. Um, they just announced it because uh, there's, like, a, some, basically, like, a recall on all the clutches for those planes crazy like every other facet of the imperial guard the composition of its regiments again varies wildly when facing the massed numbers of a tyranid swarm or the hit and fade tactics of the drakari the standardized methods of organization lose their effectiveness and entire armies must be restructured to best combat deep threats more varied and versatile deployments are often favored by local commanders Amongst the more exotic forces utilized by the Astra Militarum are the warp-sensitive psychers of Scholastica Cytana. Their value to the Imperial Guard outweighs the moral repugnance they evoke, unleashing warp-fueled devastation equal to an entire company of heavy guns. 
Less unusual, but still uncommon within the Imperial Guard, are the varieties of abhumans within the Militarum Auxilla. Millennia of mutations and extreme environmental conditions have shaped sub-races of hulking ogrins and keen-eyed ratlings, who have found great success as shock troopers and scouts, respectively. Did you say ratlins? Is that like a rat-human a rat -human mix? A common saying is that the only true standardized piece of Imperial equipment <laughs> issued to every regiment... Welcome back, who? Such a thing would never be said within their presence, however, for it is the task of these political officers to maintain the morale and loyalty of their troops, doing so typically at gunpoint. A commissar has the authority to overrule even the commanding officer of a regiment, and can inspire their charges to accomplish what has not seemed impossible. <clears throat> even the unassuming lab gun, the most widely used weapon of the Imperial Guard, exists in a thousand models and variations. It can be constructed out of wood and plastic, metal and composites, emblazoned with golden sigils, or garish, improvised improvements. It can function as a sniper rifle or pistol, a lightweight weapon easier to handle and aim, or illegally modified to deliver more energy per shot. It can be built in advanced assembly lines, or by hastily trained peasants. That looks cool as fuck. I don't know if this is like a consistent beam kind of thing happening. Those weapons are always really cool in like Halo and games like that. This dude's armor looks awesome too. It's like, com it completely matches his weapon. That's why I love, that's why I'm loving 40k so much because I'm just like a armor nerd. I just love cool ass armor and weaponry. It functions even when covered in dust, mud, or drenched in water. Neither blazing heat or frigid cold impedes its effectiveness. It is simple and reliable, a perfect metaphor for the Imperial Guard. The modern Astra Militarum began as the Imperial Army. The force was first used by the Emperor of Man during the Wars of Unification on Earth, and later to support the advances of the Space Marine Legions during the Great Crusade. Wait, they have armor on the hot dog? Was there like a cup? Was there an armored cup? <laughs> If you know, you know. Space assets, with no differentiation between the space-based and ground-based branches of the service. The betrayal by War Master Horus and the subsequent civil war he unleashed forever tarnished the reputation of the Imperial Army. Now, I've seen these eyes every every once in a while. I know it's on like the the God Emperor guy, his armor. Uh, does anyone know what that's about? I I, I need to. Need to know why there's eyes. Unnumbered regiments joined the traitor legion, spreading death demons probably across the Imperium. When it was reformed as the Astra Militarum, all naval assets were stripped from its command and organized into the complementary Imperial Navy. With neither force able to mount a campaign without the support of the other, the threat of another large-scale rebellion was, in theory, removed. In all the ages since. The Imperial Guard has remained the backbone of the Imperium's defense. Its forces have fought across every battlefield against every foe, enduring the stain of defeat and seizing the exultation of victory. Its greatest commanders have entered the highest pantheon of Imperial heroes, with names like Caiaphas Kane, Fly Marbo, Ibram Gaunt, Lord Solar Macarius, Sebastian Yerrick, and Usarkar Kreed, known across the entire galaxy. It is the name Olanius Hayek, however, that is revered above all others. The extent of his deeds, and whether such a man ever existed at all, has been lost to antiquity. But, according to legend, at the height of the Horus heresy, as the Imperial Palace and all Terra burned beneath the might of the Ruina Towers, a single man placed himself between the Emperor of Mankind Archtraitor Horus Lupercal, War Master and Chosen of the Four Gods of Chaos. Some accounts claim it was a terminator of the Adeptus Astartes, or a warrior of the Legio Custodes, but every guardsman... Wait, they got terminators, or is that just a rank, or like a faction? ...knows with certainty that he was nothing more than an ordinary man. A mortal soldier who faced down the greatest terror all reality had to offer, and died standing. Alien tyrants, immortal intelligences, 
the dark gods, and the universe itself make mockery of human life. For against the terrible foes of mankind, a single guardsman alone can do nothing. But a guardsman is never alone. They are deployed into battle alongside their fire team. Hey yo, smart. Always gotta have your battle buddy. That's what I that's what I was taught. Even if you're just going to the bathroom, you better take your battle buddy. He better be there. Their squads and sections, their platoons, companies, and regiments. Their armies cover entire continents, entire worlds. Behind them roar the engines of battle tanks bearing the names of immortal heroes. Formations of war machines of such scale and power that entire mountains might be ground to dust beneath their tread. Overhead, the skies are filled with gunships and attack craft, unleashing such fury that the sun itself is concealed behind the black smoke of rocket propellant. At night, entire horizons are lit with the fires of heavy guns, a declaration to the enemies of the Imperium that they have come here to die. But should every world fall, every fortress be overrun, and the gates of Terra defended by the last guardsmen in the Imperium, they will still not stand alone. The spirit of the Emperor is with all who fight in his name. And while no army is big enough to conquer the galaxy, faith alone can overturn the universe. Damn, that's pretty epic. Is that the end? I think so. Hell yeah, that was very cool. Yeah, again, thank you guys for continuously recommending videos to me. Uh, again, recommend whatever you'd like. It could be 40k, it could be anything else. Um, I, I eventually, uh, I've been thinking I might break into like SCPs. I, they just interest me. Uh, I've heard a lot of interesting things about them. So, but anyways, yeah, I'll catch y'all next time. Thank you.